this is weird. I've often joked that I'm not a very good guest on other people's podcasts. I'm probably a worst host on someone else's podcast. So <laughs> welcome to Physio Matters. Um, so I'm here with Neil, Helen and Jack to talk about a new partnership, collaboration between the MACP and Physio Matters. And I've got a, a ton of questions to kind of dig into this, this new partnership. But before we dive in, do you guys want to introduce yourself? Uh, why not get Jack out of the way? Yeah, thank you. And uh, really, really excited to talk about this. It's been a long time coming and, and therefore the, to, to sort of celebrate it and talk about it publicly and to add some meat on the bones of the story is going to be fantastic. I'm Jack Chu. I'm a physiotherapist and a podcaster, a broadcaster and um, a new media uh, sort of commentator in many ways across the MSK space, um, really passionate about raising standards and doing so through um, both my clinical interests in MSK rehabilitation, but then also through policy, education and collaborating across the board with different organisations. Um, I run a clinical practice in South Manchester as well as then Physio Matters, which is a sort of media company in healthcare. I also founded MSK Reform, which is a non-profit think tank, which operates it again in the MSK space. Cool. Thank you. Helen. I'm Helen Welsh. I'm a consultant physiotherapist um, leading an FCP service in Northern Ireland. And I'm currently chair of the MACP. And I've known Jack now for quite a while in terms of involving him and starting to engage him within the direction that the MACP wants to travel. And again, I can only echo what Jack says. It's great to finally announce our collaboration and to discuss it with you, Oliver. Great. Thanks, Ellen. And Neil? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Neil Langridge. I'm currently working at a health sciences university, AECC University College. I'm the uh, director for clinical and rehabilitation services um, as previously um, consultant physiotherapist for ten years um, within the NHS, and I, uh, the current one of the current vice chairs of the MACP, and I lead on the education and approval committee. Uh, and once again, uh, I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, I have long association with um, Physio Matters and, uh, and and a lot of Jack's work, um, and I'm always really pleased to be able to to collaborate across some of the. Um, the, the new models of uh, work that uh, continue to come out of that, that team. So, yeah, really happy to be here. Cool. Great. Thanks, Neil. And I'm Ollie Thompson, and I, here, I'm here in a, okay, I suppose, a capacity as my host of the Words Matter podcast, but I'm an osteopath and I work as an academic uh, at the University College of Osteopathy. So maybe we start by, I suppose, just describing perhaps each of you, one of you, the nature of this relationship, this collaboration, and we'll explore some of the historic uh, events that either led up to it or perhaps didn't prevent a previous collaboration, but who wants to just set the scene about describing what this collaboration is all about? Neil yeah. would be really well placed there, if that's all right. Neil? Yeah, sure. So um, the, this stems right back to um, some of the work that uh, I was part of in developing a, a standard of practice for First Contact, uh, which um, is uh, now published as a uh, roadmap, which essentially takes an individual through primary care first contact practice into advanced practice. And those standards are inherently based on um, the IFOM standards, which are the International Federation of, um, uh, of Manipulative Physiotherapy. Um, that's an international group that the MACP sits under. These are international uh, standards that are graded at level seven, so master's level standards. And there are a set of competencies that any, any MACP member has to attain through theoretical and uh, cl advanced uh, assessed clinical practice and clinical skills. So these were a set of standards that were agreed and published by Health Education England. Um, and we then started to develop ways in which we could try to support individuals working their way through these set of competencies and capabilities. So what we did within the MACP, we looked at some of the courses that we offer and asked there, the tutors and the, and the deliverers of those course, can you map your courses to these competencies so when someone attends your course, they'll have a, it's, it's purposeful. They can link it to a, a standardized, recognized, validated framework. 
So we started to build that up. And I had a, a good working relationship with Physiomatis team and recognized they have a huge range of educational material, fantastic tutors, internationally known, highly evidence-based, critically reviewed, critical thinking applied. Um, and so I thought, well, here's, rather than trying to develop our own within the MACP any further, let's reach out to see what's already out there. Can we start to collaborate and bring this amazing set of uh, educational resources as part of um, the way that individuals can map their own learning towards some of these standards? Um, and so that's how it came about. I, I, I reached out to Jack and we started talking about it. I said, well, if you can map your work um, against these standards and engage um, a lot of your, your team into this, because it's a huge piece of work, we'd be delighted to see if we could take this further. And maybe, Jack, to what extent, was it just by, by luck that the Physio Matters kind of content maps to or is congruent with the ACP roadmap, is it just by sheer coincidence or has there been a kind of some forethought about you generating kind of course content to map to that? Or will there be a shift? I mean, is it now the case that you're going to look through your directory and think, God, that doesn't map. We better delete that course and plug in something. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's really interesting because I've thought about that quite a bit because there's, there's three parts to it. One at least is that I think it's congruent because the values underneath what it was all aspiring to are so similar, right? We're aspiring to best practice, but also trying to recognize where is that competency bar that we want to try and make sure, right? What we, 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 we never, we hope there isn't a ceiling, but we're chasing the ceiling. Like what can be, what can be excellence, but then also recognizing, right, what's the floor? What, what commonality do we need to have? What confidence do we need to have in our peers here for when, Joe and Josephine blogs present to MSK, regardless of sector or, or professional. Um, so that's why I think that that's where it's definitely not thoughtful and purposeful. Then there's the second piece, which is that we all just follow each other's work, right? So it, we've, been, we've been then almost exploring that similar thing in such a way that then um, as as is man and the team's job to pay attention, we've been persuaded by and hopefully been persuasive across the board. So you're going to have that natural mixing, even though you're not directly collaborating. Although with both both Helen and Neil, as well as other MSCP colleagues who've contributed to that to that work so we share share tutors they've been on the podcast neil um famously i'm making bush now but the, the most popular physio matters episode of all time um is 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 with neil language and so therefore it's ridiculous to think that they've been completely you know, parallel tracks and then the third thing is that the roadmap that neil describes as well as the as that was building, we kept in touch and I was paying close attention and very keen at that point in policy. MSK, I was starting big R's before that, that was, was starting paying attention to what that looks like in a governance sense. Means that then we did, as we were developing things like Therapy Live, we were going to have advanced practice tracks. We were going to be recognizing that safety related, triage related, what is going to be compressing practice into smaller windows for uh, first contact? Therefore, what are the key things that people need to know? What are the, what is the emerging even litigation evidence around things like culinary requirement? So we, that's the more purposeful stuff, right? We we definitely did then subconsciously still, but but we were almost mapping content and creating content for that effect. So it became. Uh, it's still a, still a fair task because there's a lot of material we've produced, but it became then noticeably similar uh, and, and wasn't overtly um, having to having to put a square peg in a round hole. Helen, is there, you're thinking about that that congruency. Is there what, what kind of struck you? I suppose about the the kind of natural collaboration between the, the two organisations. I I think kind of the the recognition um of and, and the drive that we need to have uh, an msk standard that flows across healthcare professionals uh, and that's what the roadmap to practice is and has been adapted for um uh, and as part of that scoping period um they looked at recognized standards that were there worldwide and and I thought was hand, uh, was highlighted as a standard that could be used and adapted for the UK healthcare population to use. And the fact that it is 
it's been seen as a foundational subset of both the roadmap to practice and um, it will be a foundational subset of the MSK AP educational standards. It's a natural evolution for kind of educational content providers and HEI courses and short courses providers to start to, to map because as clinicians, we're we're looking to have some governance and some um, accreditation of our, our education and, and mapping to a standard provides almost that educational reassurance that um, there, there's value in, in what we're doing. Uh, and we saw Physio Matters and the value and the content they provided as an, an automatic obvious partner to approach in terms of, of widening that educational provision. And then there was an also move within the MACP. We've traditionally been um, focused on, on uh, higher education routes to membership. Um, we have had portfolio routes in the, in the past, and we wanted really to reestablish our standard and our um, accelerated portfolio routes, recognising that wealth of experiential learning and the provision of quality and short course provision that people have. And, and finding a way of, of recognizing that people can bring evidence in multiple formats and multiple ways that we can accredit and recognize and have as a route to our membership, but also wider to validate advanced practice and consultant level practice. So just for, that, for me, so currently you can, as an MACP member, you go to the kind of car boot sale of CPD courses and just pick off the courses which meet the standard which you need to satisfy for registration is that, is that and so and so now we've got it all under one roof with physio matters yeah there's a, obviously there's a there's a discount essentially where members will be encouraged financially and um from a sense of quality to engage with the physio matters kind of courses is that is that right? So apart from convenience, there's an yeah. economic economic. There is there is an it it depends on what you want to use the courses for, and and the fact that we have all signed up to the over an overarching standard means you can use a course for a variety of purposes. So you can use a, a course that's mapped against the standards either to submit as part of your FCP portfolio submit as part of an advanced practice portfolio, or it can be cross-referenced so you can link it um, towards a portfolio of experiential learning to MACP membership. Mm -hmm. So that's really the currency that having that link standard across MSK educational provision provides that flexibility of learning mm -hmm. and for learners to use their education as a, as a currency for multiple developmental routes. And just so, Jake, how will this collaboration sh change the content or see the kind of nature and the, the courses and content you have? Or is it just the case it's just going to be the same because it was congruent? Or are you now thinking actually there's opportunities to kind of you know kind of digress into different topics? Or actually, like I said, is yeah. is it the case that there are there's content? I, I don't know this, but there's content which doesn't which falls outside, for example, the values or the standards of the MACP. Yeah, I think that the there's two two extremes, let's say, and I'll I'll say where I fit in the middle of that. One would be that this partnership is 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 so uh, persuasive and so alluring in such a way that then we shape everything we touch and do according to it, and therefore that would be to my audience an accusation and fair accusation of selling out, right? It, just completely, completely corrupts what we've done that's different that's then led to this. And then it just completely then end up being um, it overly almost tidied and shaped by a, a congruence to this document and, and, and other things. That would be one extreme. Uh, the other extreme being that we would be like, we won't change for no one. You know, it's uh, it's that we're going to then suddenly go left field. We're going to take a take a, a complete right turn and, and, and produce content to this effect. And, and, and let's see if the MACP tell us not to. I 
I mean, it, it, so I'm describing compliance and petulance. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm being cartoonish there because it's somewhere that we know, and this is where we, why it took some time and we were careful, is that the spirit of collaboration in this instance is one of which both organisations are trusting where each other are in such a way that the MACP are saying, we're back in the processes of which physio matters have gone through through, in which then they are going to produce uh, content and do their thing in such a way that then we don't need to agree with every single little last thing of it, but it means that if they continue to map what is appropriate across to our to our both values as well as then the roadmap, means that then our members and aspiring members and the people that we hopefully then persuade to become affiliates, consider a portfolio, etc., and then comply within that system of which historically we've critiqued we're then moving them through in such a way that then they can they can it, ma it makes it easier for everyone they're not feeling like everything's just separated or that they have to pick a tribe or pick a team it's it's not that well i really like these podcasts and events and stuff but it, it's such a shame how separate it is to when i want to almost formalize my accreditation journey now that i'm incentivized to do so it's like it isn't fair on them that they have to either pick one of those or if they want to do both that that then is a massive difficulty paper exercise it's like both organizations should have made that easy for that person because who is that person that person is someone that is wanting to do their very best for their patients wanting to further their education and understand better aspire better to the evidence what on earth are either of the organizations for if not to make life better for that person so that they can help more people i just find it you know it just now that we've done it <laughs> it's almost like well yeah of course um, and so that that i hope answers the question we won't be changing anything but also we won't be so as to not truly be informed by what the MSCP as an organization, its members, and, and, and this wider community of practice informs us to, because that's always how we've created content. You know, we, we have a massive feedback me mechanism and, uh, and a massively distributed leadership, really. Neil, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I, I did. I just wanted to add in that the, the for folk that are, are utilizing this partnership and gaining the the, the knowledge and um, the the the, the um, information that that Jack's team produced, the key to it is what you actually then do with that information. So Jack's team have mapped it, which gives you a guidance. The key to the, what you then do with it, it's the critical evaluation and the triangulation of critical review of that um, podcast or educational material. So. Although we are, we are guiding people and there's a parallel to that, the step in for those individuals is to what you then do with that information. So it's not a passive recip recipient. It's actually that critical reflection of that podcast and what you then do with it and your application into practice and how it then informs your current knowledge, how it challenges your current knowledge and what it might do for your prospective um, clinical career. So I just wanted to make that really clear that it, just because you you would listen to a podcast, that doesn't mean you that's your competency signed off. It's 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 hugely informing, but it's what you then do with that information. And, and there's no have you guys thought about the the risk of CPD becoming formulaic? So now there's a kind of you know there's a lack of variation or diversity within the marketplace it all kind of looks a bit like physio matters it's blue it's, it's all blue colored <laughs> and there's a kind of sense of it's you know it's, it's all the same brand and is it is it there's, there's only pepsi from now on there's nothing else is there is there any risk that some of the smaller uh kind of providers educators miss out i mean i suppose they would then jump ship onto physio matters but that may not be practical or feasible what what have you given that any thought well yeah and i, I definitely want to get, get helen's thoughts on this because she's yeah. informed mine quite a lot really on this because i you know i will admit that when we were talking about this and i knew the work that was going to be involved and i also knew the challenges of how we were going to need to try and move both audiences to comprehend this partnership meant that i was like well this ain't worth it if it isn't for exclusivity and uh, and, and that wasn't just a commercial reason that was just as a means of protection and safety because it was such a it was something that but then, and this is where i say I invite, invite helen on this and, and uh, other colleagues of hers then in the macp quite rightly then said that the spirit of what we're trying to achieve is far more appropriate to make sure that then this sets a precedent for others to then be able to marry it up regardless of size you know it's not 
it's, it amuses me that we're a big player now. You know, it just kind of tickles me. And I, but I, I do understand why that might be. And in, in both size and scale of content and what we do now is, is uh, we do reach into various different places. So it, it definitely needs to be that we don't pull that ladder up. So we've set up a system in which then there is an educational partnership that people could then, if they are content producers and they want to then go through that process, there is a process that's been created by the MACB very sensibly to do that equitably and fairly in such a way that then we wouldn't be prioritized. We would be one of a suite of options. And also the reason that that is something that is absolutely the right thing to do and made me realize it very quickly was because that is the spirit of what Physio Matters has tried to be. It's as broad a church as it can be. It's every, every, nothing is held sacred. Everything is scrutinized, but not in a sort of nihilistic skepticism for sake of skepticism's point. It's always been like, does that stand interrogation through various different logic models? How does that inform your clinical reasoning rather than dictate a new route forward? How do we not try and delineate by modality or style of practice in such a way that then we've got camps again? We've been trying to level that forever. So it would be hypocritical for us to then imply that we need to be the only show in town and everything needs to be blue, uh, as you describe it, which I think is fair. So that both structurally, again, through, through uh, Helen's leadership there, as well as, the you know, again, the right decision, Plus the fact that then culturally it would take it would take for us to do a U-turn on our values and be called on it publicly, no doubt. If we were to then try to to put walls up, and it, it would be it'd be farcical. So I hope, I hope that goes somewhere. And then we should be measured against that. You know, I'm saying this and I mean it, and that then the the, the market will will help us to to make sure we live by those values. And then would you like to follow up? Yeah, I I would kind of echo what. Um... Uh, Jack has, has said, you know, historically, we've worked with a range of educational providers in terms of our HEI courses, and each of those individual courses has a distinct flavor and a distinct approach, but they all map against um, an educational standard. Um, and each of them, each of the course leaders would argue very much about the difference that you might get on each of those courses. But your overall outcome of educational quality is the same. Um, when we first had this discussion, we wanted to make sure that the educational provider, the preferred educational provider, had a status that you had to uh, attain um, and it's quite a rigorous status. You know, Jack and his team have gone through a considerable amount of work to map the range of courses against the standard that we have um, helped and provided some um, uh, governance oversight uh, and worked in collaboration with the team to do that. And that is not a small task that, that Jack and his team has, has undertaken and all credit to physio matters that they have done that. And that really gives us confidence as an organization that we are more than happy to recommend those courses to our members and to the wider MSK community that they, they map against our standards because they've gone through that rigorous governance process. And, and that's the same governance process that we apply to any of our HEI courses that look to join us as, as member. So it's not a small task, but it's not an exclusive task. And, 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 and Jack's team has sent a benchmark for other people to, to get and to approach. And we're willing to work with any organization that is happy to reach that um, educational gold standard mark. Um, and we'll be supportive of that process to do it. And I think there's there's room at the table for a number of educational providers to give that flavour, to give that variety, because we all know as adult learners, we don't all learn in the same way. And it shouldn't be a uniform approach to um, learning. But we should have a criteria that that learning is designed to achieve. And if you actually have a look at the, the standards in their totality, um, there's a, a lot of variation and flexibility in those standards, looking at research, looking at leadership, looking at management, looking at critical, uh, clinical reasoning, looking at critical analysis, as well as looking at a practical skill acquisition. So there's plenty of breadth and depth for courses to be developed that will have aspects that will link to the educational standards, but may not map in their totality 
to give that flexibility. It really does me and Neil as well. We we years ago were talking about the fact that then some of the rigidity, most of my critique, early doors critique on the MSCP was that there they weren't that there wasn't that breadth of access or variety, or that it wasn't necessarily contemporary, both in its form and its content, in such a way that then it would be a massive mistake that I think we would spot if we were to then make that mistake again, just with new media. And I think that that, that thing that, that sort of inspired this whole thing um, and, the, and the things that, that the journey that, that, that me and Neil have been on in, in, in sort of initially putting heads, but realising that such a similar thing was motivating us on that is, is to counter exactly what you're describing, I think, Ollie, because it's, you've absolutely nailed it. And that's almost motivates a lot of it. And when you were going through this mapping process, did you notice that there were areas which were particularly strong in terms of the complement of courses that you offer and areas which which you kind of just about met the standard, but actually was was weak? And was there a kind of gravitation towards the typical MSK subject, which which people have a pretty big appetite for? Yeah, I think we, we were fortunate that this sort, especially with the advent of, of Therapy Live, we have done, we have been pretty prolific in recent years. You know, if we do this, this, all that we're describing would have applied well a couple of years ago, but then there would have been over gaps, I think, especially with regards to, say, um, to, to leadership, systems management, that sort of stuff would have been definitely lacking on, as well as educational theory, I think we would have been lacking on. Um, fortunately, in recent years, we've we've done more work in that direction, uh, partly because we've done just a lot more content as we've all been locked in as homes and we, we were we were well placed to create multimedia content as as the company we were. Ah. And the area that I think probably is a bit you know lighter. Uh, for, for me is on uh, some of the specific detail um, on things like uh, imaging requisition, blood work, um, you know, th- those sorts of really quite, quite specific advanced practice skills where those things have come up within say podcasts and webinars about a body part or area, but have not necessarily been then zoomed in on in terms of what does that look like on a governance and responsibility level? What are you doing with that information? How is that truly informing your clinical reasoning as a um, a test or modality? And I think that that's an area where we want to take it off the pressure off the learner to have to go finding those five minutes in each piece. And, and there is some content to be produced there. It's that's an area that is this thinner on the ground on the library. Um, and so we did notice that absolutely. And it was a very useful exercise for us to go through to notice those gaps. Um, but it's similarly, you've got this opportunity where as on our Physio Matters Library, we've run sort of quite what seemed narrow business shows, right, for, for private practitioners that need to understand things like sales and marketing or understanding what, what is an ethical approach to promotion of healthcare in, in, in this country relevant to our wider governance uh, in, in, a, in a rather public-led system, and rightly so. It was interesting for us to then look at that against the roadmap and think that this might be stuff we just need to chalk up as not. But the way in which that can inform leadership skill and the way in which that can help people to truly comprehend their role and value and their position in society and stuff, it was really nice for us to realise that that also had its place and that the MACP, the roadmap, wider IFOM standards, recognised that breadth and and further reminded us as to why this was a good match it was kind of like there they were definitely areas we thought that was like well if anything we probably thought we could uh well, let's not bring that to the spreadsheet we thought we might be able to have a bit of time off uh, and instead it, it did map across not to everything but to something and i want to touch on not dwell on but just touch on why historically maybe you thought it wasn't a good match and why the match didn't take place sooner and and Perhaps, Neil, you want to talk about some of the perceived differences between the MACP and Physio Matters or the, some of the differences in values or, or uh, kind of why this, why, why now? Why has this happened now? Yeah, so I, I, I do think that actually the values are, are, are aligned. Jack mentioned that earlier. I think the values have always been aligned. I think what we've had historically, um, with the MACP is a natural hierarchy. Um, and if, we, if we're pre sort of podcasts and 
internet and access to information, it's, it was driven by individuals offering their knowledge. It, it, what you have to, you have to admit is, is a quite guru-led model. So a singular person offering a, a, a philosophy um, and their interpretation and their interpretation becomes yours. And I think that, that that drove a very narrow model to expertise and excellence, which you sat on the top of a tree or top of a hill. Um, and I think what happened then is, it, certainly from my, it's just my personal observations, is that as you saw a growth in knowledge at every stage from student day one right up to advanced practice, that they've got the range of of knowledge available to them and it's actually being delivered directly in, in multiple ways as helen said we learned in so many different ways we were driving very fast rapidly evolving reflective practitioners at much earlier stages in their careers than when i qualified and what that did in my opinion is that that challenged these hierarchies just by natural selection it wasn't by design i don't think it was by any sort of grand plan there was this natural tension and, and so the MACP in itself, in its, its entirety of how its persona would have, you know, we had to look at that and say, well, actually, our model is about critical thinking and clinical reasoning and evaluation. What we need to do, we now to encompass and, and, and encourage this is happening all around us, not just within the organization. And we've got to change the, the way that people see us in that this is about technical skills. This is about knowledge and reasoning and the development of reflective practice and critical review. And so I, 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 the, the clashes happen. I just think it was, it was I wouldn't even describe it as clashes. It's actually a coming together and a discussion where you're seeing different points of view. And it was then as we realized that there were some really common values and common aims and goals that parallel started to just naturally come about. But I just think you've just got an historical emergence of the way that knowledge was translated from, you know, from one very long process of individuals leading a, a philosophical approach mm -hmm. to care to the evidence based model that was shared far more broadly and widely. I concur that. And I think as well, it's, it's, it's sorry, I'll even jump straight in, but um, the it was super institutional to me. Like I, that, that was the thing that I just couldn't, I couldn't get my head around. Now, not a lot of people know this of my background, but I had no problem with the MSC, but I also had more insight than a typical graduate. I was always MSK centric, even as a student, very interested in that. And so I then qualified into it, aspiring to get on that treadmill and turn it up as fast as I can and just get ahead in MSK practice in my 20s. And I graduated from not University of Nottingham and I volunteered over and over again. Now, it sometimes baffled my peers and my educators as to why I was like this, because they were, you didn't usually have me throwing my hand up to be not in the pub and instead doing extracurricular, but I would volunteer constantly to be a model in the master's exams. I was always there. And the reason I was there is I was, what is that next step? What is it? So what am I graduating into as an undergrad? And then what does that look like? And at the, at the University of Nottingham, that is a, a, a sort of famous legacy MSCP course and taught by the uh, lecturers of which I know and look. But what I then couldn't comprehend is that then that next step looked actually more formulaic than the reasoning model of which I was being set out on the world to. It wasn't meaning to, I didn't think, but it was just that then the acquisition of skill, particularly manipulative skill, that was more particular with its handling, that wasn't necessarily, you know, the, the aspiration was you needed to just, you know, pa pass these past these tests i then came out and, and became an educator myself and started to use broadcast media as it was emerging to start asking questions of that model it felt like a more natural tension that they that that history that i admittedly didn't revere as much as some would have liked me to and and and, and that not everyone but some felt put out that I would, you know, who are you to question that? Whereas that's just no, you know, more as a, as a temperamental thing, you know, the last worst thing you can say really is that, that um, to me is to imply that I need to be over a certain way because it's always been that way. It was, it was an expectation from some to doff a cap until you understand it, young man. And it, that were never going to wash, especially because I was leading everything with a question mark. And so it was like, 
there were what I felt were explicit claims being made for the MACP that this is what you do to aspire to excellence and then accredit excellence in this way. And I found that way to be too narrow, that that felt like a walled garden. It felt exclusive and it felt like part of what was motivating people to aspire in that way and to accredit in that way was to be part of that walled garden and to be a bit aloof. Now, I was admittedly a mid. I perceived that more than was actual. You know, I, that, that, that partly what fueled me and the team at the time, I'm not going to pretend that that wasn't some of what fueled our identity as a counter-revolution to some degree, and that the MACP was you know, just purely symbolically um, something that we probably were the antithesis of. And it wasn't necessarily as fair um, as and when I look back on, over it. I understand how it happened, and it was never anything personal. But it was more that this is the legacy institution of which then uh, uses HEI as education, and you accredit yourself against these master's modules, of which you paid for and have and, uh, and attested. And I just did not see that, especially with regards to them being manual therapy derived and them being about where you poke and press, as well as then when they did bring in, say, movement-based skill, it was always very formulaic. So if you learned about movement theory on those courses, and again, I was modeling those exams, you would be measured against Shirley Simon criteria. Everything needed to be within its box, right? And, um, and, and that I did feel we were producing things that were so different. We were saying that you can, all you need to be doing, we are all benefiting from anyone in their spare time thinking in this direction, which is what CPD was increasingly. Budgets were being cut on people being paid for by their trusts and service providers. So we were getting people listening in their commute to our podcast, and I just felt such an affinity to the audience in thinking like, Good on you. You're driving to work. You should be listening to the radio. And instead, you're, you're thinking, how can I be better at treating these? And I just I just thought, unless the MSC people come up with a reason as to why that was the model, not a model, then I was always going to poke at that. And I think that that's where some of that tension came from and has in time um, you know, dissolved because we, we stopped needing that confrontation to, to define our, our character. Um, but also... I feel I watched the MACP. I don't know. I'm not saying be persuaded by us, but but the, the passage of time meant that then they couldn't came to terms with other modalities. I, I would I would echo that. I think clinical reasoning and critical thinking has always been implicit in the core values of the MACP, but we haven't been explicit in that message, and we've been through a little bit of a reflective journey about ourselves and, and how we are portrayed as an organisation within the healthcare community. And we've been self-critical of that. And we have made a decision to be very proactive in terms of really looking at uh, and redefining our vision. So, uh, you know, our vision is to is to help unify excellence in musculoskeletal health. And, and how can we do that if we don't engage with other healthcare professionals? And at the heart of the exec strategy is to try and grow and complement and support that development of that community of health, um, in, in in its wider sense. So. So really, in our last strategy review, we reflected and uh, and we decided that we needed to do more work to really al align our work streams to this this vision and this mission that we've all signed up to. And that's some of of why we've we've reached out to Jack and and, and engaged with Jack in Physio Matters. It's why we're, you know, developing that that 14 fish portfolio, which will be um, open to, you know, multiple healthcare users to utilize. And that's why uh, we are in the process of consulting our membership about opening up our membership categories to non-physiotherapists. So that's been kind of a self-reflective and a strategic work stream that we've done over the last kind of three years but that's been building on a momentum of sea change that's been coming probably over the last five to ten where we've 
we've critically looked at ourselves as an organization and seen where we need to go in order to to live to that that mission and vision that that we want to become and uh, we're happy there's no existing tensions i mean that that you know, given the the primacy that kind of manual therapy skills had has within the macp and how manual therapy is kind of presented and conceptualized and discussed within physiomatics i mean you, that that's there's no continued kind of arm wrestling about how to discuss and i'm just speaking manual therapy because it's common intervention etc cetera, etc cetera, but jack you're comfortable with how the macp present and discuss manual therapy and likewise with you neil you're happy with how it's taught through physio matters and so if jack has a cpd video podcast which completely bags manual therapy based on kind of evidence philosophy that it might be congruent with the standard of critical thinking within the macp but possibly not skill acquisition around manual therapies how does that how do you solve some of those what are there existing tensions i'll ask you know it's a, it's a really good question i think you're right. When you look at some of the standards that we're working toward, these are knowledge, skills, and attributes. We spend a lot of time associating some of the MACP with some of those technical skills. Um, would I ever be happy? I don't think I'm ever going to be happy with a, a description of manual therapy, or you know, that that's, that's something to keep aspiring to. Because you know, I can only say I did my MACP training in 1999. My my experience is it's changed dramatically, and not necessarily my my skill, my application, or however you would have described the, the, the hands-on treatment, but actually my my thinking and my awareness and what actually is the reality of what I'm doing has changed a lot, and that should continue to do so. So we should never probably be happy and comfortable about that because that would assume that we've nailed it. And I think manual therapy isn't isolated in that. Have we nailed exercise? Have we nailed communicate? We haven't nailed any of that. We continue to improve it all the time. And one of the benefits of having, um, you know, the, the way that, that, that Jack's team has developed education is that we, we, we force that critical assessment and we do poke those questions and that's how we continue to develop. So I, I, I would, I, be surprised if Jack disagrees with me that we ever want to be the point where we've got that wrapped up. We'll put that to one side. No, I would, I would certainly, uh, certainly agree. I think one of the things that's I, I'm, I'm glad I mentioned it before because it looked contrived now. But I remind you all, and I remind anyone listening in that thinks that Physio Matters has had some sort of um, uh, being their bonnet about being hands off. I remind them that our most popular uh, podcast was with Neil Language, reconceptualizing and. Dis- driving and challenging a model of manual therapy of which we're then yeah that was a very agreeable conversation in the main because we were, we were but even back then we were, we were all saying that the mechanism the mechanism of effect remains something that matters far less and is less mechanical and less specific than we once thought and that the evidence was playing that out as well as the practice-based examples were playing that out but then it was that we also need to recognize and respect the professions of which then can lay hands in a somewhat medicalized touch manner um, that then um, we, we need to make sure we don't go too far the other way and that there is a pendulum that can swing too far and we all know what that looks like and that that's been what physio matters have said now i think that there has been then I don't understand where it comes from, although I do think, admittedly, it is a bit of uh, of clumsiness and inattention and, and sometimes uh, chips on some people's shoulder to lump us in too much as if we've been bastions of a very hands-on off narrative. And a lot of that is guilt by association. And, and also, I'm not going to sit here suddenly then uh, slandering friends and colleagues of mine that do have small strand views against manual therapy than say me and my team do but we rarely if ever produce content that was especially controversial in in that direction but we have platformed people like Derek Griffin or Adam Meekins etc because we are a platform of which then really does cover a breadth of views but similarly we uh, we we take criticism for doing that but we also take criticism for for then speaking to people who do uh, aim for an element of uh, 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 do still hold out for an element of specificity or the, the higher end skills that are harder to measure or or what have you that come to certain elements of touch or, or manipulation 
we, we, we do admittedly uh, pride ourselves in hearing opposition from both of those camps. And we are a broadcasting journalistic platform and education provider that really does want to be a broad church that feels that there are so few hard and fast answers out there that we should all be leading with open questions. And that whilst we don't open our minds so much that as brains fall out, we do recognize that we need to be humble about the mistakes that have been made before, where we thought we had answers when they weren't at all anywhere near where they needed to be. And that we all looked a bit silly. So let's have strong views, but loosely held. Let's recognize and respect the fact that then we come at things with a question that me and mine can be issuing um, either narrow or broad apologies when we've been wrong, but that time passes and that that's science, that's medicine, that's philosophy. Like we learn, we're persuaded. And to me, that's why I don't think there is an existing tension because actually you look back, a lot of that's been perceived on, on both parts uh, rather than actual. And that now we're all um, recognizing that this on the same hymn sheet, it's not really, it's not really. Is it? It's a wider hymn book at the, at the very least. It's, it's a process um, that we can that we can all comply with. That means that we don't have to agree on every little detail. Now, boring would that be? I mean, you say it was perceived, but I'm only imagining an MACP assessment of hands-on skills. There'd be very actual competencies about handling and specificity and being able to recall mechanisms. So I don't know if it, I, I don't competence, know. competence is key there, though, isn't it? Right. I, I've, I, that's an area of maturity as well over at Physio Matters as an organisation is realising the practicality of the fact that originally we were just, we did have a bit of a, we, we, everyone needed to be aspiring to be super contemporary. It, it was designed to reduce the evidence to practice gap that we were told about, right? That's what the podcast was doing. So we were often trying to hop, set the bar freakishly high. Now we've matured into realizing that on a policy level, you, you create competence. So now I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with the fact that then you're scrutinizing those mechanisms, but it's more that the MACP, in my opinion, has recognized that it can't then be, it hasn't got the evidence or argument to imply that that's what excellence looks like. So instead, I feel that they've not dropped the standards bar, but we've come to realize that for creating competency, that's where we need to be open about the whole breadth of the evidence and understanding as to the mechanisms. I think that's what it is. And I'm sorry to have interrupted, but that competency word, I think, is crucial there. And my arguments that still remain is that it's when you imply that instead of competent handling, that is such expert handling that you're then going to get results because you have made more meaningful changes, let's just say narrowly to the tissues, or that you've interacted with that person's nervous system in such a specific way with your hands that that is what is preceding your good result. Don't think that's defensible. Hold that opinion, feel free to. But I'm just meaning that if then the MSCP was to, what, what I felt it was historically, overindulge that line, then yeah, this collaboration wouldn't, wouldn't be happening. But instead, I see the MSCP meaning that hold those views meet that competence but fundamentally the organization isn't saying that that is the route that we need to we need to look closer and closer to that they, they for me have broadened the horizons they're looking through more filters they've got that fish eye lens on looking at the bigger picture how can we create competent clinicians and, and grow uh, this impact that we can have on the population so maybe finishing up we look to the future so helen you can allude to the potential to open up MACP to non-physiotherapists and if we can potentially tie that into future collaborations with physio matters from beyond physiotherapy who wants to paint us a picture of what's coming up well, well pro probably me me and neil can have we 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 uh looked i think it was about three Three four years ago, we set up a new car category of uh, affiliate membership, and, and Jack was really helpful at that time, providing some thoughts and inputs into that affiliate membership category. So that was again starting to look at having a category for members, uh, physiotherapists at that time who had an interest in musculoskeletal uh, management and wanted to join that wider community of health that would sit underneath the MACP umbrella. So that was kind of that first stage. And as I say, we've gone through that self-reflective strategic overview. 
which has led the executive committee now to reach out to our members to give them a proposal that we want to widen that affiliate membership to open it up to, to non-physiotherapists in terms of that wider community of, of health um, and providing that, that forum to have that critical discussion and that debate and to grow that body of evidence so as it's not a static process, that evidence and application of knowledge becomes a dynamic transformational process rather than a line in the sand. Um, so we're in the process of uh, scoping our memberships and driving quite hard for a membership vote for that to happen. Uh, and we're hopeful that our, our membership will, will vote on that kind of in September. And then that can go into our next stage in terms of where we go as an organisation kind of in, in the future. We're, we're working with our, our partners with, with 14 Fish, and this is why uh, Jack's courses are, are so valuable, because anybody using that, that portal to support their evidencing for an FCP sign-off then doesn't have to look through their evidence and think, right, what does this course already map to? Jack's team has provided that information they go to the spreadsheet, they can retrospectively go through and cross-reference about their domains and capabilities. So we're really pulling all these strands together to make up a joined up approach and, and using our partner organizations to help us realize, you know, that, that vision that hopefully will continue long after I step down as, as chair in um, October and the next exec takes over for me and drives it even further. I'll pass over to Neil at that point. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, for me, uh, the, the future, this is absolutely is, uh, as Helen says, this is about building that vision around a community of practice. My, my time within the MACP, uh, I've had different experiences and what I always, um, be really excited about is that opening up and partnership working uh, you know the, the end of silos the end of descriptors that actually put us into boxes in the way that we describe ourselves I'm a x type of physio or I, I, I'm associated with this type of philosophy we've had far too much of that over a long period of time and hence why I can see the vision the MACP is to actually be part of, of leading that change um, we're not asking um, to be the singular uh, model, but what we are wanting to do is partner up. So most importantly, for that for the patient, the, the, the confusion around patient care and the application of treatment paradigms and philosophies is starting to wash away that it is really about best evidence, musculoskeletal health care, and not about a philosophy or a, a guru-led approach. And so that sort of step into that space for me is what why this is, is exciting and exactly why I really enjoy being part of the current executive and why that for me has given that opportunity to see actually, you know, this is what makes being a, a clinician really exciting because you are drawing from so many multiple um, perspectives and, and, and areas of practice that can only help you deliver your practice in a more informed way. That sounds like a good place to end. Jack, do you want to add anything? It was a good place to end. You sure you want me to spoil it? Um, I, I, I'd like to, again, reiterate my um, thanks to the MACP for working with us on this because it would have been good of them anyway to say, we invite you to do this. But the way in which they, they've helped us to, to understand and comprehend their models and systems in such a way that then we could um, aspire to them. Because I think that that means that we all understand each other on that that deeper level and that there has been some sunk cost in a, in a way that, that, that I think is going to stand as stand as well. Um, I would say as well, the timing is relevant. Um, I think that as we all reemerge uh, as best we can from uh, what has been, of course, a, a very disruptive time with the pandemic, but also where we've kind of realized that on a workforce level, there's various challenges. It naturally speaks to the fact that then why wouldn't we we'll, we'll be wanting a big collaborative MSK workforce? But then the question becomes then how do we measure each other's competence? How can we respect each other's histories? But whilst recognizing that the, the things that, that unite us are far more important 
and whatever divide there's intra and interprofessionally in such a way that then it just feels that the only way in which we can solve our version of the public health challenges that we face as a society, both, both of course, and you know, as a country and internationally, is, is one of which we recognise where we can get as best bang for his book and, and the, to set, help people scale their function, understand their personal goals and drive forward together. And that education is obviously crucial to that, accessible education, being able to trust um, the processes and, uh, that we all comply with, um, is, is one of the big breakthroughs that have made this happen is that the MACP have stood forward and said, look, this, the, the, what, what has been done with the HEE work is a true aspirational standard that we can all then comply with appropriately so that that can unify because it's something that was uh, so well done and well written that the, we know that that encompasses as much as is, is appropriate and can be alive and moving, evolving thing too. You know, it's, 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 it, that, that was no small thing. And I think that that's really helped us that had physio matters have come up with something or had MACP have come up with something and then we're all trying to then work out whether or, whether or not we want to comply. I think it would have been a more of a challenge, but instead for the, you know, that we've taken an opportunity on the timing to say, no, that is, that is the best route forward. And that is a way in which we can all aspire to it. And therefore, I encourage everyone that might be interested in what Physio Matters has done to really look at and consider sensibly joining the MACP as an affiliate member, at the very least. I think it's 20 quid, is it, Helen? It, it, it is at the minute, but it will go up when, because we're including 14 fish as part of that. that You're not going to... Well, Sock it to me, and it's not going to be a grand, is it? It's still going to be cheap, is it? <laughs> I'm about to try and sell it, but it, it, either way, it's been, you know, it really that that, and the price point is just one point of accessibility, but it's more that it's start, the history being that you needed to be on a pathway to aspire into, and, and, and always needing to sort of chase what was then to some a narrow sense of excellence. Now it's that. Any interested party in the UK, increasingly more professionally, or hopefully the later in the year, joins the MACP, and therefore we can together work towards how we can raise standards in the industry and make us better at helping people with pain and injury in this country and beyond. I mean, what on earth is it all for if not that? But at the moment, we're too fractured, and that is really clumsy. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things that excites me most, is that the whole point is for us to lay some foundations, demonstrate... Uh, a true collaboration and, and welcome other organizations and individuals to give it a give it a chance you know realize and try and cast off some of the biases and preconceptions understand where uh, you know doesn't mean that this you know you welcome uh, more questions to challenge that 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 history but generally speaking why can't we work together back helen and neil thanks so much Thanks so much, Oliver. Thank you. Okay, that's a wrap.